In chapter 8, we spent a lot of time looking at the shapes of molecules and saw how the shapes of molecules can affect whether the molecules are polar or not. This polarity of molecules will lead to forces of attraction between molecules, or intermolecular forces. This is what causes gas particles to coalesce into a liquid, and then liquid molecules to then solidify into a crystal lattice. So quite literally, intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules. That's what the prefix inter means. And the key to intermolecular forces is polarity. This is why back in the day when people used to go to restaurants, you used to get those dipping oils, and you could see the little balls of balsamic vinegar floating on top of the olive oil. Olive oil is made out of these long chains of fairly nonpolar molecules, where vinegar is aqueous acetic acid, which is predominantly water, which is polar. The polar molecules of water are not particularly attracted to the nonpolar molecules in oil, so they are not miscible. In fact, they are immiscible. There are very little intermolecular attractions between water and oil. They don't mix. The most fundamental of intermolecular forces are called dipole-dipole attractions. This simply means that molecules that have dipoles attract each other. Now remember, a dipole is simply a way of drawing polarity in a molecule. So if you have a polar molecule, the negative side of one molecule will attract to the positive side of the other molecule. This is an intermolecular attraction, the attraction between molecules. It's not nearly as strong as a covalent bond or an ionic bond. Those would be intramolecular forces, the forces within a molecule. But these weaker intermolecular forces still have a big effect. We wouldn't have liquids and we wouldn't have many solids if it weren't for intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonding is an intermolecular force you've probably spent time talking about. And all hydrogen bonding is is it's a very strong dipole-dipole attraction. Molecules that experience hydrogen bonding are just extrapolar. And so the attraction between the molecules is stronger than normally polar molecules. In order to experience hydrogen bonding, your molecules must either have an NH bond, an OH bond, or an FH bond. If one of more of these bonds is present in your molecule, then your molecule is going to be particularly polar, which means that it's going to experience a very strong intermolecular attraction, hydrogen bonding. The intermolecular force that's most interesting to me is called London dispersion forces. And it's not because it was discovered in London. It was discovered by London. This is an image of Fritz London sitting next to Erwin Schrodinger. Erwin Schrodinger is responsible for those S, P, and D orbitals that we talked about earlier in the year. And it's not a coincidence that Fritz London was a colleague of his. It was Schrodinger's understanding of electrons that helped Fritz London describe his dispersion forces. What Fritz London did was give us a better look into what van der Waal was discussing. We had discussed van der Waal's forces earlier when we were talking about ideal gases and real gases. Van der Waal corrected the ideal gas law to show the real behavior of gases. What Fritz London did was he described why real gases deviated from the ideal gas laws. Why is it that gas particles would attract each other? London dispersion forces can cause even nonpolar molecules to attract each other. They do this by inducing a dipole. They can make things that aren't polar on themselves become polar. And here's a real simple look at how that could happen. Here's a look at a hydrogen atom with its two electrons bouncing around in the 1s orbital. The electrons are not stationary. So at any one moment, the electrons might be in this arrangement. And then in the next moment, the electrons might be somewhere over here. And then the next moment, the electrons might be somewhere over here. The electrons are moving around randomly within the atom. So it's very likely that at one point in time, the electrons could be unbalanced, where two of the electrons are on one side and there aren't any electrons on the other. In fact, it's not only possible, it's actually probable. It's unlikely that the two electrons would be perfectly balanced so that they were equal and opposite each other all the time. And the more electrons you have in an atom or a molecule, the less likely they are to become balanced. When the electrons are unbalanced, then the side with the electrons becomes slightly negative, and the side that's missing the electrons becomes slightly positive. It has a dipole. But the electrons will continue to move, so they could go back to an arrangement like this, or an arrangement like this, and then become polar again. All of it is happening randomly. What Fritz London came to understand is that you have multiple atoms together. If one atom in the middle just spontaneously becomes polar, then the electrons in the neighboring atoms will react. So if this middle atom all of a sudden has its electrons go to the left and its electron deficient on the right, 
well then its neighboring atom will have its electrons repelled and move over to the left and now it's electron deficient on the right. Whereas the atom on the right will have its electrons attracted to the left and now it will be electron deficient on the right. So just the spontaneous polarity of this middle atom induced dipoles in the neighboring atoms. It forced the neighbors to become polar. And once that's done, now these atoms can attract each other. These are London dispersion forces. The more electrons you get, the stronger these attractions can be. So there are cases with molecules with lots and lots of electrons that will actually have stronger intermolecular forces than something that experiences a dipole-dipole attraction or a hydrogen bonding. But generally speaking, we consider London dispersion forces to be the weakest of the intermolecular forces.